Welcome everyone to a new episode of our Heartful Conversations podcast. Today I am truly honored and grateful to have a very special guest, Ed Dunkelblau, whom I have had the pleasure to first meet back in um, September 2018 when Verita International School invited him to Bucharest for a conference on emotional intelligence and empowering our children. Welcome, Ed, and thank you for being so generous with your time and for accepting this invitation. Well, thank you. Uh, it's actually my honor to uh, be invited. Uh, my, my visit there was just so uh, awe-inspiring and the work that you're doing is so exciting and cutting edge that it's it's my pleasure to be involved and be a part of it. Thank you so much for these words. Um, I want to say also a bit about you. Um, Ed is the director of the Institute for Emotionally Intelligent Learning. He is also an internationally known speaker and consultant on topics of social emotional learning and character development safe schools programming and humor in education. That's a topic I would like to maybe explore with you on another podcast sometimes. That would be great. So let's see. Well, I wanted to say, first of all, that beyond, you know, this um, formal presentation, um, something that is extremely relevant um, about you is related to uh, my personal experience of uh, meeting you when uh, you came to Bucharest um, and to Verita School, because you came at a time when we were, as you remember, maybe struggling with finding the best way to implement and to support social emotional learning um, in school as a, a tool of developing essential life skills for our students. And I remember the meeting we had with you. It was our social emotional learning team with um, Richard and my colleagues. And we were all, you know, sort of worried and frustrated. And we had so many concerns about how to make SEL work and how to inspire teachers to take it on board, how to have, you know, parents cooperate and, and um, close the circle somehow. And I remember that we were just there, you know, rambling, going on and on and on and explaining and minutes and minutes went by and you were listening with such openness and, and patience. And, uh, at one point, after listening to what, all we had to say, um, you just took the time and you were um, so compassionate and you were so non-judgmental and you offered so much um, empathy and so much detailed feedback that has helped us so much on our works uh, on our work the year that followed. So to me, that was kind of like I remember I was talking to Andre and Marius uh, <laughs> days after, thinking you know that was like you know a direct embodiment of social emotional learning. You know, while we on the other side were just so <laughs> all over the place with our uh, problems and our concerns. So to me, that's something that I was left with. Um, after our meeting and something that I came back to um, time time and time and again when we had some other more passionate maybe discussions in our in our team and we were trying to kind of say what would Ed do in this moment how would he <laughs> how would he react to all of this <laughs> so I felt like sharing this with you because uh, I think you remember those days I do. You're, well, you're very kind. Uh, it was actually uh, very easy for me to listen as as your passion and and expertise was really ex expressed in, in those meetings. Uh, I think that any any system, especially school system, that's taking on the task of really being intentional about social and emotional learning and character development. Uh, there's going to be discussions, there's going to be development, there's going to be uh, a back and forth uh, debate about how to do it, what to do, how to allot resources. So that's all part of, of building a strong uh, program, a strong intervention strategy, and a strong sustainable method for, for producing uh, uh, those skills in, in kids and adults. So it was a pleasure for me, and certainly uh, I, I appreciate you sharing that. Thank you, Ed. Well, I thought that to begin with, since uh, social-emotional learning is um, 
still in many ways seen as, you know, this soft skills training, uh, not really so much related with uh, academic performance, you know, a nice add on to have as a school, but really, you know, something that sometimes kind of feels like it needs to be squeezed somewhere in the curriculum. So I wanted to start from here and ask you, um, how does developing the social emotional learning and character skills improve um, and contribute to the academic performance? What is the connection between these two? Yeah, certainly uh, the history of education, at least in America, and I imagine uh, in, in Romania and, and Europe as well, is with a primary focus on reading, writing, and arithmetic. And so uh, the other uh, part of, of education was really left to a less intentional, uh, accidental almost way of acquiring uh, those other skills. And what we've found, and I've been doing this work for over 30 years now, is, is what we found is that they're not only uh, uh, tangential to learning, but they are a basis. They are really the, the rock upon which learning is built, that if there is not clear acquisition of social emotional competence, it's very hard to expect people to excel in the other academic areas. So if you think about what goes into learning in, in our school systems, a student every student comes in with a life outside of school. And that life might be calm and wonderful and supportive and loving, or it might be filled with distress and concern and problems and, and upset. And so every student that comes into the classroom carries those things, whatever they might be with them. And our hope is that when they sit down in the classroom, that they're learning ready. Yeah. But in order to be learning ready, they need a certain set of social and emotional skills that will allow them to focus and pay attention. So they have to be able to handle whatever feelings they're having. They have to be able to uh, handle distractions. They have to be able to control their own impulses. They have to be able to relate to others. They have to be able to listen effectively. They have to be able to problem solve and, and uh, work in teams and build relationships and, and understand their own uh, struggles and, and not let those uh, overtake their ability to learn. So if you think about it, for people to be really effective academically, they have to have a good, strong basis in social and emotional competence. The way I think about it is I think about it like reading. Uh, if, you're, if you're a math student, and, and if uh, all you do is uh, focus on numbers, then you're still going to struggle because you have to be able to read and you have to be able to understand and comprehend what's written. So social emotional skills are like that, that they're, they're skills that are across all academic areas that support, encourage, and, and potentiate students' ability to learn in every area of, of education. And similarly for adults, it allows adults to relate to their children. It allows re, uh, adults to relate to their peers uh, at work and to uh, work in, in, uh, in cooperation with other people. And all of us uh, are required to do that every single day. Yeah, true. Well, talking about adults, um, because this is where actually we have reached uh, this conclusion ourselves after working with uh, the children directly in class and teaching social emotional learning, we realized how important it is for the adults around them, whether it's educators or parents to have these skills. But what we've noticed is that uh, for many teachers and for parents, uh, the same taking um, these um, skills on board means, you know, more work sometimes, you know, more learning, you needing to develop yourself. And while we understand the potential benefits on the long run, it's already sometimes hard as it is. And I say this as a parent as well, you know, you have so many things you're struggling with and um, the motivation to take on something that feels extra um, is not really there. So, what would you say to um, 
educators or uh, parents who understand the importance. So the, the knowledge is there. I know why this is relevant, but uh, how can I take it on board so that I don't feel it as a as a burden, let's say? And um, why is it so relevant to do the work ourselves first before teaching it to the children? Well, I, uh, I, you ask an interesting question. I, I think that uh, I'll talk about teachers first, but then certainly we can translate it to parents as well. Uh, I don't know that I've ever gone into a school where teachers weren't busy, hmm. where, yeah. where teachers weren't already full. They were already asked to do more than they had time to do. I, I don't think there are many educators anywhere who have a lot of free time. So, so that's number one. And so everybody's going to have that concern. And, and my position is, and, and similarly with parents, you know, I don't know that there are a lot of parents sitting around you know, eating chocolates and, and <laughs> exactly. watching television all day, um, uh, even during COVID. So um, I, I think that no one has free time. So from my perspective, it's not a function of having time to do this kind of work. And it never has been. The issue has always been that I have more to do than I have time to do. So the issue is not having the time. The issue is determining the priority. That when we have more things to do than we have time to do them, then we have to decide what's a priority and what isn't. And my position is that social and emotional skill building is, needs to be an absolute priority because without doing that, many of the other things will be less efficient or not able to be achieved at all. So we really have to focus in on the basic skills, again, like reading, that allow our children and our adults to be successful. And so what we can do is we can be intentional and efficient about teaching those skills rather than hoping that they're acquired accidentally or tangentially. So it's really not a function of, not, of time, it's a function of identifying it as a priority yes true and it's it's hard at times but what i've noticed especially during this last year is that somehow um first a group of uh educators and many parents that have reached out uh to us to acquire such skills it felt like um the motivation was no longer a choice because it had come to that point where there was such a, a big amount of of stress and workload and and burnout that um these skills uh became the priority as i remember many educators when we launched um, an eight-week course on introduction to social emotional learning, but starting with um, their own well-being, how she was saying in the email that she really feels like unless uh, she understands better how to work with herself and how to manage uh, these emotions and the stress, um, she doesn't really feel like she will be able to continue doing her work and she might have to, um, to give up. So it became more relevant in a way that this is the work that we need to do. Um, but it's still hard and there are still challenges. Um, but we're- so, so let me just add one thing to that. And with COVID, COVID has really brought a lot of these needs into focus. Uh, all of a sudden we found ourselves at home with our children 24 hours a day. Uh, or with our spouses and uh, having to really call upon some of those relationship skills to uh, get through the day without pulling our hair out and to be effective. And, and, and for some kids who are homeschooled, uh, having to learn or having to uh, having parents learn how to support their kids in, in doing those things and, and, and doing the lessons and dealing with frustrations and all of those things. So COVID has really brought a lot of that into, into sharp focus. And similarly, as we hopefully soon come out of the pandemic uh, mindset, people are gonna realize how important relationships are because they won't have had them in normal fashion for quite a while. And I think uh, there'll be kind of a rebound toward uh, recognizing how important they are and wanting them to be as satisfying and successful as possible. 
Yes, yes, true. We come back to relationships, um, which is something that's extremely relevant in the context of social emotional learning. And we were sharing a bit before starting the um, uh, the podcast, how especially in a school setting, uh, there are so many teachers and other educational staff that come and go and that um, having that uh, foundation of good relationships and communication is so relevant. Um, and that's social emotional learning right there. Um, in a way, we are looking for next year, and this is um an extremely interesting question that we are uh, discussing about these days of how will the future of social emotional learning look like um, in school and how will it evolve since we've understood after years of doing um you know, separate classes with with kids to understanding how, you know, the classroom teacher is the one who um, is extremely relevant to have uh, the skills and to implement them uh, throughout the day and in all the subjects. Um, But also we are trying to stay sort of out of the box and try to think how else, how would SEL look like um, in schools in the future? How do you feel it will evolve? Well, that's a great question. Um, I think that there's going to be a a number of of evolutions of uh, social. Well, it's two parts. One is social emotional content. So what's being taught or what needs to be learned and then how it is taught. And and, uh, I think both of those are going to evolve relatively quickly, partly due to the adjustments that had to be made during the pandemic. Uh, so with regard to uh, what's going to be taught, I think we certainly have uh, what's called the castle wheel, um, where we look at the five areas of, of social emotional competence, um, handling feelings, handling relationships, um, uh, empathizing, uh, planning and problem solving, um, and uh, generating hope and optimism, uh, those sorts of things. Are, are going to be addressed in much more detail with uh, a lot of supportive resources and uh, they'll, they'll permeate the uh, pre-K through 12 curricula. Uh, right now, sometimes they're integrated, sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're add-ons, sometimes they're not. I think as time develops, it'll be recognized that there has to be a threefold um, initiative, one that teaches specific skills, one that integrates those skills into the entire academic curriculum, and one that addresses the uh, school community and outside the school community to parenting. So I think all of those things are going to evolve and become more explicit, and, and people are going to be more comfortable uh, utilizing those skills and building them into their curriculum. Uh, I think similarly, there's going to be an increased awareness that core values have to be a part of social emotional skill building, that identifying uh, what it is we hold valuable and what it is we hope uh, our children acquire as human beings, what values uh, we hope they acquire as human beings becomes part of it. And similarly, we can instill some uh, sense of purpose in our, in our uh, students, and I, frankly, in our adults as well, that there's yeah. a purpose and meaning to why we're in school, what we hope to be as, as adults, what we hope to be as human beings, how we hope to contribute. And, and finally, given uh, uh, the, the world we live in, I think there are some political slash social elements that will be integrated into social emotional learning Uh, looking at things like equity, looking at things like uh, anti-racism, looking at things like helping uh, people develop uh, curiosity and healthy skepticism so that uh, whatever they read on social media is not necessarily accepted as fact. Uh, So I think all of those things will actually be uh, folded into a social, emotional, and character development uh, initiative. Yeah, I feel the same way about how 
and although it starts like on a personal level, and this was our focus as well, you know, uh, instilling in these children these skills and modeling them and spending um, a lot of time revisiting and using reminders, because this is a long term process. And I feel like I want to reiterate this idea of how this uh, cannot happen overnight and, you know, studies and we've had many talks on this, how it takes three to five years of um, consistent um, implementation of such programs in schools to see results. But then after this personal level where, okay, as also as a mother, I can say I want my son, you know, to start learning about his uh, emotions, to recognize in them in himself and others and differentiate them and have the tools to come back to the green zone, as we call, you know, the okay zone. And, but then it's also about coming back to relationships, you know, how he will relate with others. And then even further, if I'm looking in the future, wherever he might be in the world and whatever work he might be doing as a leader, you know, if he will have the empathy and the compassion uh, to contribute and not to produce suffering around him. That's something that's really relevant. Although um, for many parents, especially in the young years, it's that focus on, you know, having the child be able to do this and that and having those expectations. But on on the long run, it's, it feels like there's a lot of change that we, it's obvious now that needs to happen at a systemic level. And that's also in the way that schools and, and classrooms and teaching um, in general should support learners to adapt to this fast changing world. And um, how do you see social emotional learning playing a part in this process? I'm sorry, playing a part in the process of in what exactly? The, in in uh, uh, having the systemic change of how uh, education happens in schools right now. Yeah, I, I think that um, one of the things that, that has to occur is that teachers uh, or educators, I'll say, have to be oriented toward um, the importance and value early on in their, in their training. So we have to uh, look at bringing it to the um, pre-service to uh, people who are where, where they're getting their training so that they're sensitized to the importance of that. Um, I think also as it becomes more commonplace, I mean, one of the challenges we've had in, in introducing uh, social emotional character development programming in schools is that the educators that are presently on the job didn't have it in their training. They mm -hmm. didn't have it in their schooling when they were in school. So it's foreign to them. It's, it's unclear of what it looks like and how it integrates with everything else they're doing. So getting that training out becomes really, really important. And I, I know that you're aware that there are online courses available through Rutgers University and the College of St. Elizabeth where educators can actually earn certification in social emotional learning and character development instruction and, and also administration. Yes. And so um, uh, I think a key element is helping people, one, understand what it is, two, understand its importance, three, understand how it looks in schools, and four, then having the tools by which they can feel competent in providing those services. Yes. I was thinking, as you mentioned that, that let's say you have, you know, this really enthusiastic school that, you know, wants to start with such programs and they, they understand the relevance and the importance and they want to do the training. Um, and I've noticed, you know, there's that uh, initial excitement and enthusiasm with this. Um, and then because, as we've talked before, like you were saying, you know, teachers rarely have any free time. And usually in a school, anything that comes up as a new idea and something that could be used like in a PD day, in a personal development training, um, feels like, okay, it kind of needs to be squeezed here and there because the calendar is already full. And so talking about uh, priority, um, this is something that we need to give time, right? I mean, uh, a training a year or twice a year doesn't do the job. I mean, it's something that I want to emphasize on because you've had so much experience working with so many schools around the world. And I would like your input on, you know, how 
long does it take and how much does it take and how much effort you have to put in this uh, when you want to see some results? Because, you know, you can have a few trainings and then it happened also, you know, to us that, OK, we had this and we're doing it in school. But see, you know, there's no improvement. And, you know, kids talking about classroom management or behaviors and this and that nothing happens. So it doesn't work. But actually, it takes time and it takes more than a training a year, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, I, we would never try to uh, teach math that way. We would never try to teach reading that way. And yeah. and so if, if we really want people to learn what it is we hope they learn, then we have to uh, be willing to put time and resources into it. So um, a lot of a lot of schools, although you know, I accept that whatever schools try and do in this direction is a good thing to do. But what we really want to encourage is to not just have this as an add-on and an occasional uh, tangential moment, but have it as an integrated part of the school curriculum. And in that way, over time, people just recognize it as important, as valuable, as as uh, seamless in the learning process, and it's it's given a level of uh, oh importance, I guess, uh, so that people can can uh, value it and learn from it. Uh, it's 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 a good start. I know that schools do what they can, so they sometimes build in just kind of an add-on. But I think that's only a start. I think it really uh, uh, the goal is to have it integrated throughout the school and to be uh, have places where those specific skills are taught, practiced, learned, and relearned. Yes. Thank you for that. It's um, I we were really touched to see there is a lot more openness um, and interest in educators. And we've had on our um, eight week course on our educating course um, in early spring last year, just after the pandemic started, um, we have this course where we can work only with maximum 20 people um, at a time and there was this incredible request from over 100 educators to sign up for the course um so we felt we really felt i think it was the first time in many years when we felt that um it's become pretty clear that these skills are really necessary and that it starts with uh, the work we do with ourselves. And um, we were we were truly touched by that. And we are hoping with um, a Compassion Education Resource Center to, to offer these resources. And uh, the Rutgers University course we took a while ago, um, you know, I think it was more than three years ago, all of us in the team was extremely relevant. And another thing that helps a lot is connecting with this communities of educators around the world like we did during the um, the course we took with you guys and to see that you know this is uh, the sim some of the struggles you're going through it's similar with other people's and other educators struggles out there and sharing the knowledge and the building these relationships where we can use the experience because it's something that's um, you know it's been it's being built as we as we speak and we we are still learning so many things so um, it really helps to be part of these communities and uh, these courses so this is an encouragement for all educators who want to take this on board more seriously um, I, I think the the interest that you've generated is a, a function uh, directly to your expertise your passion and your attention to what's needed in the school systems where you are uh, I, uh, having done this for over three decades, uh, you know, it's been, a, uh, we're, we're getting traction internationally now. Um, so it's, it's kind of a, a, an overnight success that was 30 years in the making. Um, and, and so I think it speaks to the product you're providing, the services you're providing, and the expertise in which you provide it, that really uh, the word's getting out, so people are seeking you out. Uh, similarly, you mentioned the uh, Rutgers and St. Elizabeth online courses. If people were interested in that, they could go to selinschools.org and, and 
check out what those things are, which are online, and um, I, I think address some of the some of the content and questions that you were just describing. Yes, so, um, yes. And, and those are uh, readily available. So, uh, and and plus, uh, uh, if you uh, that website also has a tremendous number of resources. So, if people listening to this already have an awareness and a, a capability in SEL education, but needed resources and ideas, um, they could go to that website and really access dozens and dozens of articles and how tos and videos and all sorts of stuff. That's great, Ed. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, I will make sure to put the, the link also when, when the podcast is ready. Because, um, yes, sharing resources, I think this is the time more than ever for everyone, you know, to share the things they've learned and the resources and the courses and um, and get together. The more we are, you know, you get that critical mass and this is where things start to, to be built on. And we've really felt this uh, throughout this, uh, this year. Um, I want to come back a bit now to uh, parents because we said we would um, we would talk about all the adults around children. And just as we've had many educators reaching out for these resources, we've also had some courses for parents. And surely enough, it was related to the stress level and to the burnout they were experiencing during this uh, very challenging year, working from home and being with the kids and having to, in many ways, become part-time educators for their children um, and addressing uh, their own stress. And um, if we are to think about how we can get parents more open and interested in these skills, how can the school and the teachers and the leadership of the school involve parents more in cultivating um, these abilities at home and where would you encourage uh, this process to start from? Uh, that That's really a very important question to address. Um, and it really depends on the parent community and how active they are, how engaged they are. Uh, some parents are very engaged, some parents are disengaged and a lot are in the middle. So I think there's a number of steps involved. One is that the school system has to make the case to the parents that uh, parents, again, as we talked about earlier, parents are busy, parents are full, parents have plenty to do without the added uh, task of addressing these skills. Yes. So I think that that whoever is representing the school, whoever is reaching out to parents have to be able to make the case that this is worth their time, this is worth setting their priority. And that uh, whoever's making that case has to be tenacious because you're not going to be successful the first time. It's going to be an ongoing conversation. Now in 10 years, I would say this is going to be commonplace and everybody's gonna go, of course, you know, this is, this, there's no selling that has to be done here. This, is, this makes perfect sense. But I think for now, we really have to get the parents' attention by figuring out what is it parents need? What does it parents want? And how does this address what parents want? And, and some of those things are parents need their children to be in school. They need to have them learn as much as they can learn. They need to have their children be uh, reasonably well behaved in, in, in context of school. Uh, they want them to grow up to be good human beings and to have the kinds of skills that will allow them to be good human beings. They want them to be uh, good community members, uh, develop good relationships and friendships. Uh, those are all things that I think every parent would say, yes, I want that for my child. And that's what social emotional skill building will allow children to be and do. So I think that taking each of those areas and making the case for parents and then letting the parents know how they can support that learning, how they can support that competence in ways that parents can do. Not every parent is equally capable. So having opportunities for parents to learn, giving little, uh, um, 
you know, uh, words of wisdom for a day or a week or a month, or here, try this with your child. Uh, so those are all things that parents uh, can be invited to do. Having uh, coursework for parents who are motivated to learn how to do it in more detail. Uh, pairing it with other school activities that parents are involved in, whether it's, it's um, parent-teacher meetings or sporting activities or uh, other, uh, other things that happen at the school that parents are invited to, having a social-emotional element or, or having representation of social-emotional uh, skill building at those things so parents become more familiar with it. Because remember that most parents have not had this in their school. They haven't had it in their own education. So we're almost speaking a foreign language. They're not quite sure what it is and why it belongs there. So we have to really uh, meet the parents where they are and invite them in and, and make our case. The other, the other case to be made, not only with parents, but also with other community members, is the research value that we found in social emotional learning that, that students do do better in school. They do better on tests. They are uh, better able to handle difficulties at school. They're less likely to get into trouble at school or conflicts at school. So I think those are also things that parents want that social, emotional, and character development really supports. And finally, to invite parents in a little bit at a time. Do not expect huge commitments immediately. And any programming that goes on should have parent representation as well. Uh, so uh, in, in the States, when, when we set up programming in, in uh, school districts, we try to set up a committee of administrators, of teachers, of support uh, educators, uh, like clinical team members, uh, aides, things like that. But we also try to have parent representation as well so that parent voice is heard and concerns can be addressed. It also acts as a portal for parents to talk to parents as opposed to having uh, school administrators or educators talking to parents because sometimes the language is different, sometimes there's a trust level that's better. So those are all things that can happen. And, and the other thing is to make sure that we use multimedia to, to reach parents, uh, this webcast, not only email, not only text, not only uh, video or, or Zoom meetings, but also written materials, um, uh, activities, uh, you're probably better at thinking of these things than I am. So uh, just to find as many ways to reach parents as possible and not just be reliant on uh, email or text. Yes, yes, that's true. Really relevant points. Thank you for sharing them. And um, I've noticed, and one of the things you, you said um, just about now was how, you know, you need to take those small steps because what um, I've noticed, and that's my personal journey also, especially when you are connected with so much information and how this is also relevant uh, for the development of your of your child. And you kind of get into that mode of, oh, I need to do this and that and that. And if you're not being careful, you can really quickly go into um, that reactive mode where this becomes, you know, the next thing to do and it becomes a very stressful thing to do that you feel like um, you're failing at and you need to learn more and you need to do more. And with all the stress that everybody's encountering, um, it's completely counterproductive. And that's why in a sense we started with uh, sort of the well-being and addressing the stress factors and understanding how you know, we're all doing the best we can. And sometimes just being with your child, you know, present and having that playtime where you're really connected, um, then in itself is building those skills, you know, and not, uh, I remember, you know, some years ago that I was, you know, reading all of these books and you're very specific with the things you need to learn and how to do them. Um, and um, it became sort of like an agenda about it and having to, to reach there and feeling like, you know, it's not good enough and I'm not doing the best I can. Um, and that's a vicious cycle. So I, we encourage and I encourage everyone to have that kind of 
you know, gentleness and patience in this process and to address their needs to begin with. Um, otherwise, it just feels really, really hard to do anything extra. So, yeah, I, w- I would even uh, encourage you to back it up one more step that nobody wants to be told what they're not doing and what they're bad at. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I, I think that uh, it's it's not energizing for most of us. Uh, it, 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 in fact, it's exhausting. Yeah. So I think one of the places to begin is to recognize what people are already doing, both with regard to uh, teaching the skills and practicing the skills themselves. Uh, I, I have a saying when I go into school systems that what's good for the students is good for the staff. Mm-hmm. And what's good for the staff is good for the parents. So uh, to think about the kinds of skills we want our children to learn, but also to begin to recognize our own ability to practice those skills becomes really important. One of the things we did at a school that I, that I really enjoyed is uh, we did what I called upside down learning, where rather than asking the parents to teach the students the SEL skills or problem solving skills, we had the students go home and teach the parents. Mm-hmm. And, and it's it's amazing how much more attentive parents are when they're teach when their child is teaching them something. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> yeah, you reminded me of a story some years ago when we had we had it was in the beginning of the of the school and we were in, we were doing more mindfulness and attention based, you know, um, classes with the kids and learning about the emotions and you know self regulation and. We're using, you know, these colors for for children to relate to their emotions. And as I mentioned before, you know, you have this green zone where everything is okay and you feel good and relaxed and calm. But um, you also have the the red zone where, you know, you can be really angry and you have a lot of tension in your body and a lot of energy. Um, And there was this uh, mother that came one morning and she asked to, to talk to me. And she told me, you know, having tears in her eyes, how... Uh, being at home, coming one day from work, really exhausted. The phone rang and it was, again, somebody from work, some unfinished business. And she started uh, getting into this conflict over the phone and she was really tense. And her five-year-old daughter was um, at home, um, apparently reading a book. But of course, you know how kids are. They uh, they sense and they hear and they see everything. And then after the mother finished the phone call, the daughter came to her and um, embraced her and said, Mom, I feel like you are in the red zone. Maybe we can <laughs> sit down and and breathe together, and I'll teach you how to give yourself a hug so you can feel better. <laughs> <laughs> so then we realize, wow! So the kids, the things that we're doing at school, you know, this is how you reach the parents to the kids. Um, and I've had a lot of tough lessons. It, it's so true. <laughs> so it, that it's so true. I. I uh... I was working with the school and uh, you, you, you have to really take the, take the wins where you can and be gratified where you can. And it's a school I've been working with for a couple of years. And just accidentally, uh, the second grade had gone out on a field trip. And as I approached the school door, uh, all of the second graders were getting off of their school bus to go back into the school. And uh, unfortunately, I managed to stand there and hold the door for all of these second graders as they were walking back into the school building. And each and every one of them thanked me for holding the door. And uh, for second graders to be that conscious and appreciative was just very gratifying for me in realizing that our social, emotional and character development programming was actually working. Yes, yes, that's extremely relevant. I I remember we would get energized by by the kids, although, you know, on the big picture, we were always, you know, dissatisfied or frustrated with this and that. It was like those small moments in class when you would have that child come up to you and say, you know, how, um, how they felt so good or how, you know, being able to, because sometimes we would just address the basic needs, right? We would have the class sometimes in the evening and sometimes after, you know, in the beginning we had our agenda you know this is the curriculum we have to teach this and that but um as we learn more and more and we realized that what they needed was kind of like some time 
on their own. Sometimes where they don't get any instruction, nobody comes in to teach them something. They're right. just okay the way they are. And you see right. them and they feel heard and they feel seen. And that for them was just enough, you know? And um, it's so nice for me to see after years, like I haven't been teaching in, in close to two years now. And I still have parents or, or kids that I meet from time to time uh, in school. And they just remember this particular time when we were doing something together in the class or um, they ask their parents about us as a team and where we are. And, uh, you know, they remember many beautiful moments we had. And that to me is the most important thing at the end of the day. And it is kind of like the confirmation that while it does take time. You have to keep that trust that those seeds are planted there. Um, but that's also the hard thing to do for many people, not having that immediate feedback. You know, it's a hard job as an educator because it's like with parents, you don't know you're, you're putting the best there, but you don't know how it's going to end up <laughs> when the kid turns 18 and leaves home. And sometimes it's hard. So that's why we kind of come back to to ourselves and to the work we do with and patience and and gentleness and self compassion. One one of the I'm so glad that you mentioned that. One of the things we would do at schools is, uh, especially in elementary schools, uh, let's say it was a, a kindergarten to fifth grade uh, school. At the end of the year or at the end of however many years we were there, we would have the fifth grade teachers thank the kindergarten teachers, because by the time the kids got to fifth grade, they were pretty well socialized and had pretty solid social emotional skills. But those poor kindergarten teachers were dealing with uh, uncivilized uh, uh, kindergartners. <laughs> and so they were teaching the skills from the ground up. And, and that was really valuable. The other thing that we found to, to your point is that as the children acquire these skills, it's empowering. For them, whereas they would bring problems to the teacher to solve, once they were capable of doing problem solving, the teacher could go back to the class and say, here's the issue, go ahead and figure out how to solve it. Yeah, that's amazing. Yes, well, uh, it's really nice to hear these stories and they're kind of like what what feed us, you know, to, to move ahead because it is challenging. And um, at times I know I personally had moments where I thought, you know, is this, uh, is this really going to, to get somewhere and are we going to, to reach some milestones? And now after close to five years um, and after this difficult year that we've had, um, in a way it just brought to surface um, even more, the relevance of it. And um, I think it is the future. I mean, I don't see it going any other direction, especially in education, um, that we become, we are more centered and more grounded and more in contact with um, the fact that we have to deal with this whole thing, you know, with the mind and all the emotions and what's happening in this body and how we work and how, you know, we can't ignore this anymore. Like even if you talk on a physical level, you know, the challenges with uh, COVID and everything, it, it you realize how important it is for, for us to be physically, but also mentally and emotionally healthy and how they balance each other and you need to be there. And slowly everyone starts, like you said, I like that, you know, you, ha you have to start with where you are. I mean, there's no right or wrong. You just start with. There, there's a challenge in that. Um, and it's something that I'm calling uh, social emotional humility. And essentially one of the areas that I struggled with is I would start working with a school or school system and we would move along and then we would uh, uh, move into a next set of grades. We would do grade by grade. And that next set of grades would be very frustrating to me because I would forget that they haven't been through anything that I've been through. They haven't been exposed to the things that the other grades have been exposed to. And they're really starting at zero. And I would forget that and I would get frustrated that they're not learning faster, they're not implementing faster, they're not accepting faster. And I think there's a real tendency for us as educators, especially those of us that have been working in the field for a while, to forget that most people have no idea what we're talking about. 
and that they don't really know what it means to implement these things in an organized additive fashion. And we have to exercise a level of what I'm calling social emotional humility, recognizing that they are where we were X number of years ago. And it, we, we can't reasonably expect them to be more quote unquote mature than, than they are. Yes, it's true. I can admit to that, that we've, we've been there many times. And um, especially for us, because we were not uh, educators and we were uh, faced with uh, the challenges of uh, that as well. And, and being with the kids in class and, and learning, um, it was um, at times um, a matter of, um, you know, trusting the process uh, on one hand that, you know, we, we, and it helped a lot to get, you know, all the courses and to learn more ourselves, but also that day to day being in class with the kids and, and, and um, deliberately looking for the small things. Cause you know, you want to see the big things. You don't want to see the big, but just looking for those small things that they were so rewarding and that came from, from the kids. Um, and this is how for the others I see, you know, when we would meet with the teachers and they would notice, you know, that kid who would never, you know, put their hand up. He never wanted to share the morning circle. You know, he started slowly to speak up or all, all those things. And, um, so building from there, from, from what happens on a daily, because uh, a lot of educators are so self-critical and they get discouraged by the fact that they don't see, you know, the immediate results. And just because, like you said, you know, we remember ourselves in the first days where we were like, OK, let's just give up. This is it's never going to work. We're never going to make this happen. Um, and just being there, come, come on, let's trust this. Let's we're, we're together in this. So I, I come back to the whole community idea and to feel that support because it can feel very isolating when you're just by yourself in your class with the kids and you know so getting this togetherness and and uh, sharing what works and what doesn't work um, in in a school setting is really relevant um, and it kind of points to the uh, one of the last questions I wanted to ask was uh, if you know there's a school out there and leadership is um, open and they want to to start this process um, where should they start from especially when it comes to teachers and the uh, and the buy-in because uh, well I would say you know why do you need the buy-in to begin with but let's say you know there's a school and the leadership they're listening to this podcast they're like okay that's amazing that's great what what do I do <laughs> wow that's a big question um, l let me just uh, it uh, my answer may be a little disorganized, but uh, let me kind of think through the different parts of what you're asking. I uh, Let me first talk about what I think the mistakes are mm -hmm. that, that, right. that, that school systems make. Uh, first and foremost, they try to do too much too fast. Uh, it's my bias that to do this work effectively, you need overwhelming resources because you're going against uh, norms, you're going against mainstream, you're going against what we've always done. So you really need enough oomph, you need enough energy, you need enough uh, talent, you need enough, uh, uh, I don't know, sometimes budget to, to make this work effectively. So what that means is since everybody has a finite amount of resources available, that you don't want to spread them too thin. You don't want to try to do too big a task at once. So I would encourage people to take what they want to do and narrow the focus so that they have the resources to make that element work extremely well and then grow it out from there as opposed to having something a mile wide and an inch deep. Um, so that's one thing. Another is to try to convince everyone that this is a good idea. Our experience is that you don't need everyone on board. You just need enough people on board to create a tipping point. Uh, my experience is that no matter how compelling your argument, no matter how compelling the research, no matter how dynamic the presentation, 
20% of the educators will not want to do it. True. Uh, and trying to convince them otherwise is not only fruitless, but really a waste of otherwise good resources. So uh, what I encourage people to do is to take the people who feel the passion and start with them. Go where the energy is and start, start small and grow it larger as opposed to uh, a lot of places try to do whole school initiatives immediately when they don't really have the resources to do it. And I think that that's probably a mistake. I would encourage people to narrow their focus and, and, and see it as a developmental process for a three to five year rollout, as opposed to trying to do everything within the first three months. Um, things, next thing is they try to immediately do programming for students. I think that that doesn't work all that well. I think first you have to get the adults on board. You have to get the adults competent. You have to get the adults understanding what it is we're doing, why it is we're doing it, and what it's going to look like. And that sometimes takes about a year. Some schools have done it faster than that, but most not. And so, and, it, and it's not a one-time thing. You have to come back to it. It has to be a sustainable message over time for two reasons. One is that people forget, you know, uh, educators for the most part, they see new programs coming every 12 to 18 months. So they know that if they just hang on, this one will go away and the new one will come. <laughs> so, uh, so it's important to let people know that this is not going away, that this is something we're going to stick with for the long haul. And secondly, uh, education has a fair amount of turnover attached to it. So you have to have a way of orienting, educating, supporting, and encouraging new hires. Uh, new people who are coming into the system so that they understand what it is, what we're doing, why we're doing it. Uh, similarly, uh, leadership changes. So I encourage people to hire leaders who understand what SEL is, why it's important, and how it's being implemented. So those are all uh, uh, just very, very basic suggestions of things to do. If there are administrators out there, if there are school leaders who want to implement this, I would seriously encourage them to get some training. Uh, certainly the, um, the uh, College of St. Elizabeth's uh, SEL leadership training would be a place to go, or the Rutgers SEL instruction training would be a place to go. Certainly Verita has, has you have expertise there that they can seek out and, and get support from that I, I would encourage them to do. It's very hard to do this alone. Yeah. It's very hard to do this from the bottom up. Uh, one of the things we found is that the, mo the programs that are most sustainable are the ones that actively include the school leaders to the point almost where the principals are teaching classes. Yeah, I see uh, the relevance. The, the ones where the leadership says, "Go, yeah, go ahead and do that, but don't involve me. Those tend to be less successful. Thank you so much. That's really helpful and extremely relevant and matches um, the experience we've had so far. But since we've we've noticed um, an increase in interest in this area and people not really knowing where to start from, uh, I wanted to address this. So they have, you know, um, something to begin with and, of course, uh, reach out if they want to know more and we'll be here. So, um, yeah, it's. Um, it's amazing. And I feel like, you know, uh, this is a, a topic that we could talk on, at least I, you know, Phil, and I know you for sure, uh, because it's something I deeply believe in. And I see in the future how this is so beautifully being, you know, uncovered. And it's like, you know, those gems that are now being seen, then they see the light and everybody um, contributes um, in a deeper way. So um, I am really grateful to see this unfolding and to, to have such um, wise and experienced uh, people around us that we can reach out to and uh, get guidance from. Um, so thank you so much for offering your time with this. Um, well, you, and, you and the team at Verita are, are inspiring. Uh, it, it's such a pleasure. Uh, my time there, we... we Built such a bond and a connection, and your your passion is contagious. And 
I just so value the work that you're doing and, and appreciate it. So thank you for inviting me. Yes. As I said uh, before we started recording, we're really uh, hoping to have you back here uh, since we already know you have some origins here in, in, in Romania. And, uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, Grandma is, is from there. So, yes. Grandma, yeah. And to take you around maybe one day. And, um, you know, I was uh, dreaming about going to these communities because we work with a lot of uh, rural areas, uh, schools, um, public schools in rural areas. And um, uh, it's my dream, you know, to just travel from one community to another and speak to the teachers and, and give these resources, you know. So um, I have a, a very rich imagination. So in my imagination <laughs> now, I see you coming to Romania and us going to these places and, and talking to people. Let's do it. Let's do it. It sounds <laughs> wonderful. And, and now, and, and given given the COVID experience of the year, I imagine they're probably a little bit better connected than they were prior, uh, yes. uh, electronically. Yes. So yes. It, it may even it, it may be uh, more reasonable to do ongoing support virtually yes. than it was before. In many ways, you know, uh, with all the, of course, the negative side of it, but on on the educational part. If we are to still look, you know, of some goodness that came out of this, uh, it felt like a big leap uh, related to technology and how we can address. And while we were, and I still am, you know, like the face to face and working with the teachers there and feeling them. And, you know, we have all these um, in our trainings um, because we use also the psychodrama and we, you know, uh, work together and we touch and we mm, hug and with all of that. And we miss that so much. At the same time, we were so grateful that um, it felt like that connection when you bring people together that have, you know, that motivation and they're connected by that same passion. It was just off the screen, like people connecting in such deep ways. And um, it works. I mean, you know, it helps to keep an open mind and be curious about the possibilities out there. Uh, talking about soft skills, <laughs> we're learning. So it was a good lesson in that. And however the future will look like in, in terms of uh, how education will happen and, and trainings, um, I'm more optimistic that we can reach out to, to people either way. So Yeah, um, I would hope so. Still, I'm hoping uh, <laughs> we can meet. Uh, we'll figure it out. We'll, we'll definitely figure it out. I'm, I'm confident. Thank you so much, Ed, for this talk and um, hoping to have other uh, talks related to that. I'm looking forward to, I, we always encourage feedback uh, from people and to give us topics that they're interested in and uh, we'll see where it goes from here. It sounds great. I look forward to it. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>